England's longest ruling monarch before Queen Victoria, King George III ascended the British throne in 1760. During his 59-year reign, he pushed through a British victory in the Seven Years' War, led England's successful resistance to revolutionary and Napoleonic France, and presided over the loss of the American Revolution. After suffering intermittent bouts of acute mental illness, he spent his last decade in a fog of insanity and blindness. In this video, we're going to see how George III might have looked in real life. If you're new to my channel, welcome. Here on Mortal Faces, I take historic individuals we read about and recreate them to see how they might have looked in real life. So let's get started. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more recreations and let me know in the comments who you'd like to see in real life. The Georgian era began because George's great-grandfather became George I. George I's mother, Sophia, inherited the throne as a Protestant because Parliament didn't want it to go to a Catholic. So they skipped a lot of Catholic relatives in succession to get to her. His father, Frederick Prince of Wales, the son of King George II, died before the king, and so his son, George III, became Prince of Wales and inherited the throne. George III became King of Great Britain and Ireland in 1760, aged 22, and then a year after his coronation, he met Princess Charlotte of Mecklenburg-Strelitz, the daughter of a German duke, who also was his third cousin. And you can see how they're related in this video, but it was a fruitful marriage, producing 15 children. George III inherited the Seven Year War and was fighting to end it. It was a war that largely involved the British and the French. It involved other European countries as well, but it became like the original World War. Even though the British won, it created heavy debts on both sides. For the French, it eventually led to the French Revolution, and then for the British, it led to the American Revolution. Unlike in France, where the crown controlled spending, but not revenue, in Britain, Parliament determined both expenditures and taxes. In 1765, after the war, the British Prime Minister introduced an unpopular stamp tax, which taxed paper in the colonies. They were basically looking to its North American colonies as a revenue source. They eventually repealed it, but the damage was too late. It caused lingering resentment, which strained their relations to the point, ten years later, the colonists rose in rebellion against the British. The tea tax of 1773 was the accumulating straw, and it led to the Boston Tea Party, and ultimately the American Revolution in 1775, you see, they blamed King George, but it wasn't entirely his fault. Because Parliament was in charge of revenue and spending, they were responsible for the colonial policies. However, the public saw George as its face, and so they incorrectly viewed him as an inflexible tyrant who squandered his rights to govern the colonies. 1775-83 was the American Revolutionary War, and Britain lost. By the end of the revolution after 1783, with his new prime minister and ally William Pitt, George became really popular in England. His humane and understanding treatment of two insane assailants contributed to his popularity, and the British people admired him for his piety and for remaining faithful to his wife. You see, he tried to be a model husband, and he never took a known mistress. He was fond of his children and was devastated at the death of two of his sons in infancy. George was a misunderstood king. During a time when uprisings were fashionable, it was overlooked that he was against slavery. According to the historian Andrew Roberts, George wrote a document in the 1750s denouncing all the arguments for slavery and calling them an execration and ridiculous and absurd. George never bought or sold a slave in his life, he never invested in any of the companies that did such a thing, and he signed a legislation to abolish slavery. David Armitage, professor of history at Harvard University, even discovered a youthful essay written by George III condemning the slave trade. All of this arguing and war took a real toll on his health, and as early as the American Revolution in 1778, age 40, he lapsed into a month-long period of violent insanity. He was restrained with a straitjacket and suffered various treatments as crisis of rule unfolded around him. At this time, treatment for mental illness was primitive by modern standards and the king's doctors treated the king by forcibly restraining him until he was calm or applying caustic poultices to draw out evil humors. The French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars were the last events where he made any major political decisions. He initially had sympathy for Louis and Marie Antoinette, but when they died, there wasn't much he could do. 
Then the new French Republic and afterwards Napoleon declared war on Britain and George rallied an army of 27,000 volunteers for the war. The possibility of invasion extinguished after the major win of the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. In 1804, he suffered another major lapse of illness but recovered the following year, but in 1810 he slipped into his final illness. A year later, his son, the future George IV, became Prince Regent, giving him effective rule for the War of 1812 and Napoleon's final defeat at Waterloo in 1815. George III died blind, deaf, and mad on January 29, 1820. He was 81. Historians initially thought it was porphyria or arsenic poisoning, but now believe it to be bipolar disorder. In the end, he became deranged, foaming in the mouth, and his voice hoarse. He would repeat himself, write sentences with over 400 words at a time, and his vocabulary became more complex, speaking without pause. A generous, good-natured, avid collector of books, an enthusiast for music, a patron of architects and science, he was a philosopher king, but was no plaster saint. You see, he made many mistakes. He could be self-righteous and was often badly advised. Later in life, he opposed interfering with slavery in the colonies, although he signed the 1807 Act which abolished the trade. But more often than not, King George was a victim of his good intentions. And that's just a little bit about King George III. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to see more recreations, check out my other videos on my channel. And subscribe. Each of your subscriptions does help this channel grow and allows me to continue making more content for you. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see in real life. I do make a list of all your suggestions, and I will see you in the next one.